right, so let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As always, we invoke God as the source of all that which exists, and that which constitutes the source of all existence. There's a teaching in theology known as ex nihil, ex nihil, meaning everything came from nothing except God. So he's the source of all that which exists and the creator thereof. With that in mind, Louisa would begin her consecration in the divine will by saying, I am nothing. And she meant it literally, because without God, everything came from nothing, right? There was nothing without him. And with him, they became something. So I am nothing. God is all come divine will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we go into Louisa's writings, um, very busy day here, three parishes, three masses, and also some other pastoral commitments this day. You know, Sunday is supposed to be the day of rest. So what happened to that? <laughs> Not for priests. So, um, but rightly so, because uh, this is what we do um, with joy, and and we're at the service of people, and Sunday is the most intense day for most priests, even though ironically it's supposed to be the day of rest. But in a way, there is a rest in work, you know? It's not a servile work. Sometimes people ask, is it forbidden from God, by God and by the church for one to work on Sunday? And most people say yes. But we have to make a distinction, as does the church, between servile work and recreational work. Servile work is something you have to do. You know, like for a child, go to school. <clears throat> no school on Sunday, thank God. And then there's recreational work, which is something that actually makes you feel at ease or loosens the tension, eases the nerves, unwinds you. Louisa, although she worked with needle and yarn and sew and did work for the church, she found that <clears throat> not so much a servile labor, but a, a recreational one. <clears throat> Some people find that also in gardening, music. You know, when you play musical instruments, that could be work when you're reciting, practicing, right? I play the violin, the classical guitar. But to me and other people who play these instruments, if they enjoy it, it's not work at all. So that kind of work is not forbidden on Sunday. Okay. I remember when I was a seminarian in 1991 in Asti, Italy, preparing for vows. And the superior wanted us to pick grapes because we have two vineyards in northern Italy. My community has two vineyards. So we, the seminarians, were sent out to go grape harvest. And we had to pick the red, the black, the um, white, and the red grapes for the different types of wines. And then you, know, you cut them with like a a knife it's like a hook hook knife to snap the clusters you put them in a bucket the bucket is emptied on the back of a wooden truck and that takes them to the shop where they're placed on a conveyor belt that separates the skin from the pulp from the twigs etc and it was on a sunday and i mentioned that to the superior i said now here i'm a seminary and i'm learning so i said isn't it you know forbidden to work on Sunday. It was probably more of a convenient than a rational uh, criticism. Just wanted to stay in bed. <laughs> so he said, well, it's up to you. You make that decision. You know, I prayed about it. But then later on as a priest, I realized that, you know, with theology, theological training, that it's not a sin to do something on Sunday that requires, if it's an emergency work, or that's not servile. Okay, so having said that, today's Sunday, and 
the Holy Trinity is the is really implied in today's gospel reading from Mark. It's really focused on the second person of the Trinity, which is mentioned in both Isaiah and the letter to the Hebrews, and it's also picked up again in Mark. But in the letter of Isaiah, Jesus is referred to, now this is the Old Testament, so there is no Jesus yet, the servant of Yahweh, right? Who's the servant of Yahweh? Well, the old people in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament personages, never knew who he was explicitly, but through inspiration, guidance, they knew that there would be a Son of God, even though in the Old Testament God was known as one, without any Trinity of persons. Though the Trinity manifested itself implicitly, some argue when the with the visitation of Abraham and so forth. Now, um, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. I'll start with a little catechetical instruction for you before we go into the divine will. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Now I'm going to open up, ask you to open up your mics and freely answer when I, whenever I ask a question. <clears throat> All right, ready? Ready. Question number one. How many persons are there in God? Three. 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 That's right, three persons. Now. Uh, now, when we say person, we think of us as a person, right? It's a little bit different with God, and I'll explain that in a moment. The word in Latin for person is prosopon. And now the next question, how many natures are there in God? Go ahead. One, one nature. One, 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 one nature. nature. In the Godhead, the Trinity, there is one divine nature. But in Jesus Christ, who assumed a human, there are two. So it depends on which person of the Trinity you're talking about. So in Jesus Christ, before he was incarnate, there was only one nature in the Trinity, as there is today. But once Christ, 2,000 plus years ago, incarnated himself, not the Father, not the Spirit, just the Son, and received the name Jesus that was given to Mary by the angel, and that Joseph was necessary to apply to the register of the young boys who are being admitted to the faith, namely the bar mitzvah, um, then he assumed a second nature, only the son, not the father, not the spirit. So to this day in heaven, there is Christ's glorified resurrected body, along with that of Mary's, who was not a, a, who did not ascend, but was assumed as a difference. Christ ascended by his own divine power. Mary was passively assumed by God's power, not by her own. That's why you have the distinction between ascension and assumption. So in heaven, the second person of the Trinity has two natures. The Father has one, the Spirit has one. Only the Son has two. So that's why I say you're both right. When, I say, when you say two and one, two with respect to Jesus, one with respect to the Trinity, or the um, in hypostatic union of Christ. And hypostatic meanings means before he was incarnate. All right, now you know the three persons in one God, one nature in the Trinity, two natures in the Son, incarnate. Next question. How many persons does Christ have? <laughs> one person. Human nature. Well, in Jesus, there's one person. How about you? Next question. How many persons and natures do you have? Let's start with natures. One. How many natures do you have? One. So one nature is that the one one nature one person. consensus? Okay. How many persons do you have? Uh, do you have as an individual? Three. One. So you have. Allow me to introduce you to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You have. <laughs> You have one person, it's a, it's a human person, and you have one nature, it's a human nature. That's it. So your human nature is made up of body and soul. Next question. Um, how many faculties does, does your soul have? Three. Three. All right. Now we get to the will, which is, which is peculiar to Louisa's writings. How many wills do you have? One. One. You all have, let me put it this way, will, intellect, and memory, the three powers of your soul, are 
derivative of your person or your nature? If you know the answer to that, you know how many memories, wills, and intellects you have. Is it a property? Is the intellect, memory, and will a property of your nature or of your or of your person? Is it person. a is it a property of your human person or your human nature? Nature. I would say I I would say person. Human nature. Actually, your nature is comprised of body and soul. That's what the Catechism states and the early councils. Your nature is comprised of body and soul. Okay. Now, if, speaking of the Trinity, you have three persons and one nature. In Jesus, you have one person, two natures. In you, you have one nature, one person. The intellect, memory, and will, are they a property of your human nature or your human person? Nature. Human nature. Now, why is that? Let's use a little bit of logic here. The Trinity, three distinct persons, have one nature. How many wills do they have? One. one. Why do they have one will? Because it's a property of nature. If it was a person, they'd have three per three have wills, three wills. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But because they have one nature and their will is a derivative property of nature, they have one will. Okay. They have one intellect. They have one memory. All three have one memory. All three have one will. All three have one intellect. Right. Good logic. Because it's not a property of the person. If it was, they'd have three. But it's mm -hmm. a property of nature. This is, goes back to the early ecumenical councils of Ephesus, Lateran and Chalcedon. Oh, thank you. These are dogmatic truths. They can't change. And then when it comes to us, we have a human, not a divine nature like God. We have a human nature and a human person, not like God, who's a divine person. Divine persons. So when we speak of our human intellect, human will, human memory, are they a property of our human nature or of our human person? Nature. 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 Just like the Trinity. Because we're made in God's image and likeness. So if his nature has three properties, so does ours. Now, when Christ became incarnate, he took upon himself a human nature in addition to his pre-existing divine nature. So now, how many wills, intellects, and memories does Christ have? Two. Two. He has two wills, yeah. human yeah. and divine. Yeah. Two memories, human and divine. Two intellects, human and divine. Mm. But he has one divine person. He doesn't have a human person like we do. There is no human person in Christ. There's only one divine person. So when we are entering into the divine will, we're going through Christ's humanity. His humanity encompasses his body and soul. That soul has two, two, two. He's a spirit. God is an uncreated spirit who took upon himself in the person of Jesus Christ a soul that's created with an intellect, a memory, and a will. So his divine spirit has an uncreated intellect, memory, and will. And then his human nature has a created intellect, memory, and will. And uh, because he took upon himself a human nature in the womb of Mary. He didn't take upon himself a human person. When we live in the divine will, do we take upon ourselves a divine person? No. no. I like these questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we don't. We remain a creature. Why? Because if we became a divine person, it would be divine, it would be a quaternity, not a trinity. Right? There'd be four divine persons. <laughs> right. So we can't become a divine person. Right. We, we are always not remain a creature in our nature and in our personhood. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Does the person of Christ operate in us? So I'm going to read this quote to you and ask you to put on your thinking caps <laughs> and try to follow along now that you understand the, the nature and the persons of the Trinity of Jesus Christ and of yourself. Here on March 24th, 1903, Volume 5, Jesus tells Louise the following. My daughter, the soul who wants to remain in my will, always keeps my own person within itself. And although the soul can go out of my will, since I created it with a free will, 
my power operates the protege of administering to it continuously in the participation in my own divine life. It is by virtue of this participation, the soul receives that it experiences such strength and such a desire to unite itself with my divine will, that even if it wanted to separate itself from it, it would not. This is the continuous virtue of which I spoke to you the other day, which issues forth from within me and is communicated to the soul who always does my will. So what does this mean when he says, my daughter, the soul who wants to remain in my will always keeps my person within itself. So remember, we're not a divine person. We never become a divine person. So how can we keep the divine person of Jesus within us? And the answer to this question is alluded to in several passages. One is where he speaks of um, consecrating hosts whereby the soul becomes a living host. I'll give you a few passages here. He's in the soul, right, Father? Can you say that again? He's in the soul? He's in our soul? Well, remember, the presence of Christ is not limited or confined to one physical place or location. Christ is present in everything. He's present in a blade of grass. He's present present in a baptized infant. He's present in a saint. He's present in the angels. He's present everywhere, but in different modalities of existence. He's in our soul. He's in our body. So we have to qualify in what way he's present in the soul. I'm going to share with you a few passages that allude to how the person of Christ can, we can keep him as he uses these words with Louisa in us, or he abides in us. Okay. Jesus tells Louisa, and this comes from Volume 12, February 6th, 1919. My daughter, as the soul progressively encloses my will within itself and loves me, it also encloses me with my own will. In loving me, it encompasses me with the accidents of its acts that imprison me within itself, thus forming for me a host. Therefore, when the soul suffers, makes reparation, and so forth, it surrounds me and encloses me and nourishes me in a divine manner befitting me. No sooner do I see these hosts formed in the soul than I immediately embrace them and am nourished by them in my insatiable longing for souls, as they offer me love for love. Whence you may say to me, you have administered me, and I too have administered you. Now, naturally, God is present in the soul, but he's also present in the body. How is that? The soul contains the intellect, the memory, and will. When the soul is baptized, original sin is expelled by the infusion of hate, faith, hope, and love, three theological gifts that grow as we attain the age of reason and exercise the virtues. But God is also present in everything the body does, too. Remember what Jesus told Louisa about God's operation in the first human being, Adam? The Father beat in Adam's every heartbeat. The soul received three infusions of light, creating the intellect, the memory, and will. The Spirit breathed in his inhalations and exhalations. And the Son flowed through his lifeblood. So the Father is present in the body, in the heart, the Son in the lifeblood, the Spirit in the breath. And in the soul, the Spirit is present in the memory, the Son in the intellect, the Father in the will. So God is present in both body and soul. We call this in theology a psychosomatic indwelling. Psycho meaning soul. Psyche in Greek means soul. And soma in Greek means body, psychosomatic. Now, in the advanced stages of the soul's spiritual growth, after it's baptized, attains the age of reason, exercises the virtues, and begins to become holy, two realities combine to establish within the soul Jesus' real life. Now, in the Council of Trent, in response to the Protestant Reformation, the expression was established to 
explain Jesus' presence in the Eucharist that's consecrated in the host and the wine. It's called his real life, capital R, capital L. Jesus tells Louisa, when I come to the soul, in my person, I establish there in my real life. Real presence is the Eucharist. Real life is the divine will dwelling in the soul. Now, this expression, real life, is found in many of Louisa's passages. I'll just quote one of them to you. We find this uh, volume 13, November 26, 1921, and in other areas, other passages. I'll quote a few to you uh, for message, for writings to you here. This comes from volume 16, November 5th, 1923. Louisa relates. While I was pouring out my pain to Jesus, he showed himself in my interior. And the sacramental veils of the Eucharist formed a mirror. With Jesus inside of it, alive and real. And my sweet Jesus told me, my daughter, this mirror is the accidents of the bread that keep me in prison. So Louisa just received communion. And she's outpouring her pains, her difficulties, her struggles. And then Jesus appears inside of her alive and real as if in a mirror through a reflection, through the host. And he tells her that this mirror, this mirror is the accidents of the bread that keep me imprisoned. I form my life in this host, but I remain alone without the slightest requital. But do you know where I find my true requital? in the soul who lives in my will. As I descend into its heart, immediately I consume the accidents of the host. So let's suppose we receive communion, the host is consumed immediately. So I remain in this soul, and there my life resides, that's how Jesus keeps his person in us, resides just as alive and real as in the most blessed sacrament. Oh, how happy I am to form my real life in this soul. He also mentions this expression in volume three on August 20th, 1900. And the real life of Christ consists primarily of the soul's continuous cooperation, participation in the life of Jesus in the Eucharist. So while God may become substantially present in an inanimate host, like bread, wine, Louisa affirms that the same may be said of an animate subject, like a human soul. So Jesus reveals to Louisa, do you know where I find my true requital? In the soul who lives in my divine will. As I descend in its heart, immediately I consume the accidents and the other consecrated host, because I know that more noble accidents, more dear to me already, to imprison me and keep me within its heart. These accidents are the acts of the human will. I will not be alone, but with, will be with my most faithful companion. We will be two hearts beating together, united in our love with our desires as one. So why remain in the soul? I remain in the soul. And there my life resides just as alive and real as in the most blessed sacrament. But do you know what these accidents are that I find in the soul who does my will? They are its acts accomplished in my will, which more than accidents lay themselves around me and imprison me with a noble and divine palace. I illuminate and enliven the soul more than I do the sun. Oh, how happy I am to form my real life in the soul. Okay, so we become living tabernacles. Once we receive God's grace and do an act in the divine will, we increase the life of Christ within us exponentially. Okay, we have a few questions. I'll start to take them before we close out with a final blessing. In terms of the void, we know that God created creation with the void so that Adam would fill it and that God created a void in Adam so that he would seek God always to fill himself. Why don't we learn about this void in traditional catechesis or in the catechism of the Catholic Church? Because it seems like it's a big theme, theme that Catholics should know about. Um, the reason why the church doesn't mention voids is because it has not been revealed to the church ever before. Louise is the first 
in the history of Catholic li Christian literature to reveal the spiritual reality that occurred inside of Adam and Eve before sin. Why hasn't the church said it? Because the church has not been brought to the knowledge of this. It's not in scripture. It's not in the early church father's writings. Augustine speaks of it implicitly when he talks about the soul's ability to expand itself through charitable works, spiritual and corporal works. But this concept of a void, the only other place it's mentioned is in the writings of St. John of the Cross. He calls them caverns, which are voids, caverns in the soul. So the church does teach it in the sense that it promotes John of the Cross's writings who speaks of these caverns in the soul that have to be filled. But it doesn't go into the details of how they're filled with divine acts. Why? Because this reality was not possible until Louisa. So God would not reveal the knowledge without the gift. So only when the gift was given was the knowledge accompanying it. That's why only in recent times has this been revealed. Thank you, Father. Does Louisa speak about Jesus' burial cloth or specifically the resurrection at the time of resurrection? Yeah, she speaks a lot about the resurrection, speaks of it in the rounds, speaks of it in the hours of the passion, speaks of it in the volumes. Um, with Jesus' burial cloth, she mentions that when in the hours of the passion, you know, when the centurions had, uh, what do you call that, lots, drawn lots to see who would get it, to divide it among themselves. But uh, the that's about the extent in which he addresses it. If you want to know more about that, another saint that goes into, blessed who goes into more detail about the garment is uh, blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. Right. Talks about how it was woven without any seams in it. It was like one piece. Mary was the one who put it together, the blessed mother. Right. I mean, the 14 foot cloth, the burial cloth. You mean the shroud? The shroud, yes. Um, she does mention it. I know, like the gospel writers do, but she doesn't go into the details in terms of how, if the if, if we have a question is how his impression was made, she doesn't address that. Thank you. But science, science has confirmed that the only rational, science has no explanation, but they have confirmed that the only rational possibility of this image being impressed upon cloth without paint and without imaging is through billions of watts of light. But science has admitted that billions of watts would destroy a cloth. But miraculously, the cloth's not harmed at all. So that, yeah. Okay, next question. Hi, Father. I have a question about rounds. Um, Louisa teaches that we should place our I love you, I praise you, and I bless you, Jesus, in all his acts of creation, redemption, and sanctification. So the question that I have, why do we place our bless? I bless you, God? Why do we bless God? Yeah, we can uh, praise and bless God. Yeah, it's in the Psalms. Bless the Lord, my soul. You ever read the Psalms? I, oh, bless I know the Lord, it's my in a, soul. In a, in a Bible, but what? Yeah. I'm just trying okay. to find Okay, uh, all right. Remember what Pope Francis spoke about in his work, um, Fiducia Supplicans? Most people have not read it. About most the people criticize it, and most people have not read it. It's about the marriage couple, Father, I right? It. No, it has to do, that's a Tizia. Vidu oh. Triplicans talks about different types of blessing. One is ascending, one is descending. Mm. The ascending blessing is of a person who is in need of God's assistance. Whether they're living in a regular or regular relationship or whether they're just by themselves. Okay, then you have the descending blessing, which is God's benevolence upon a person. He's condoning and he's blessing what you're doing. So when you say, I bless you, God, you're not adding anything to God. But what you're doing is you are, in a way, it's part of praising him, but also increasing the accidental glory of all things that he made, because they can only increase in and through your praise to him. So when you bless God, you that affirmation can assume various facets it could be one of thanksgiving one of praise 
one of glory, one of gratitude, one of thankfulness, one of acknowledgement, and the list goes on. So blessing God doesn't mean he needs your blessing. He needs to be holy through your blessing. No, it means that you are using a biblical term that meaning is found in the Bible. You see, we can never apply to our modern English language the words that we take from Scripture. This is a big mistake sometimes. People with Louisa's writings, people criticize Louisa's writings because they don't know a word of Italian. So they're trying to interpret through a poor Italian translation what they think she's saying, and they can't do that because they don't even know what, she's, what she means in Italian. And the same thing with the Bible. We're taking it from a Hebrew, a Greek language, and it's translated in the fourth century into Latin, and then from Latin it goes into English. So it's been translated four times before we even get it. So when we hear the word bless, we're assuming, oh, that means I'm giving God something he doesn't have. We're not. Blessing is simply a thanksgiving, a praise, an acknowledgement, all the above, and rejoicing at the same time. And God loves that when you bless him. So blessing does not in any way um, imply anything other than glorifying the one who gave you life for the life you have and for all the blessings he's bestowed upon you. Okay. Yes, uh, a question came up with um, the blood of Jesus in the um, 24th hour of the Passion in your green prayer book here on page 530. It, it's referring to the Blessed Mother retracing the steps of Jesus's Passion and she comes across his blood on the ground and she says, come my angels and watch over this blood. Do not allow one drop of this blood to be trampled on or profaned. So my question is, what happened to Jesus's blood? Did it did it uh, reunite with his body when he was resurrected? Is there any official teaching on that? No, there's no teaching to suggest that either. On the contrary, uh, Mary gathered up that blood according to the depictions of several mystics, not only Louisa, but Anne Catherine Emmerich as well. And uh, they kept it in a safe place. A lot of things that were kept in the early church uh, remain, including the Ark of the Covenant in a place we don't know. So we do know that they held it in high reverence and that's why they gathered it together. And you find it also in that film, The Passion of the Christ, showing Mary gathering up the blood. And that, because that was based upon the writings of uh, the Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there's no evidence to suggest that it went back to him. Because remember, Christ, once he shed his blood in atonement for sin, he did it once for all time. He doesn't have to do it again. And when his body was resurrected by the power of God, after three days of being in limbo, and then visiting for 40 days from the time of his resurrection to ascension, um, many people. That body was perfected in its unblemished state. There was nothing on him bearing the marks of the scourging or the crowning of thorns. The only marks that remained on him were the five wounds. And that's testified to in the book of Revelation, when it says, when John says, I saw in heaven, the heavens opened and there was a lamb with the marks of slaughter. And we also find it in the appearance of Jesus to Thomas, when he said, put your finger in my wounds and do not be misbelieving, but believe. So his blood did not have to return inside of him, no. Because of the power of God restored to him all life, all the necessary vital signs, including blood, in a nanosecond. But that blood was shed once and for all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Father, for taking uh, my question. I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is uh, from our divine rule, Cynical, and uh, the second one is a personal question of mine. Uh, in, our, uh, in, in your fiat of creation video, you referenced that God made Adam's worship such that only through creatures could Adam worship God. Why were Adam and Eve only to worship uh, through creatures? Uh, could they not worship directly to God? And then my second question, or my question rather, 
is when we make a round of reparation for the purpose of uh, healing our family tree, um, I make my round to take all souls uh, in my family tree that uh, have been redone by Jesus and offer them to the Father, to Father God, to give him perfect, infinite, and eternal glory. Does that include souls from our adopted children, uh, bloodline, from their bloodline also? Okay. Yeah, the answer to both your questions has to do with intention, intentionality. If you intend, then yes. With respect to Adam, I never said, never said Adam could not worship God directly. You won't ever find me saying that. So you have to be careful with the words you use. What I said was that God directly infused within Adam an intellect, memory, well, through three currents of light. That's the word Jesus, expression Jesus uses in the Jesus writings, correntiri luce, currents of light, that has formed his soul and then, of course, his body. And then when Adam came to reason, he praised God, saying, oh, my God, my Father, the author of my life, directly talking to God. But God made Adam as the head of all creation, so that Adam's obligation and duty was to render God thanks, praise, worship in and through all things. In fact, Jesus tells Louisa, the reason God did not give a voice to all creatures except man was precisely so that man could be the voice of creatures. So God, so that Adam could praise God in and through the sun, in and through the moon, the stars, the meadows, the valleys. This is the whole purpose of the rounds. And this is what Louisa was told by Jesus to do for her the entirety of her life, from the moment she began to receive his substantial locutions at the age of 12 till the day she died. So yes, Adam could do both, but based on his intention, he did both. So, and this goes into your second question. Whether you want to include in your family healing, adopted, that all depends upon your intention when you do the prayer or the intention of the person you're having prayed for your family. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hi, thank you very much, Father, for taking my question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reading the uh, Virgin uh, in the Kingdom for the month of October. And um, in day 15, Mother Mary um, asked for the little sacrifice to honor her, to do 12 acts of love to honor her 12 years. And yeah. I've always yeah. struggled to what an act of love was. I just That's a good question, yeah. In my head, thought it might be something particular, but I thought maybe I'm wrong. Hmm. So could you help hmm. me? Sure, that's easy. Make me a pot plate of spaghetti. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, an act of love doesn't have to be physical. It could be spiritual. And this is something most people don't realize. Divine acts are not limited to the body. They could be corporal or spiritual works of mercy. So a prayer for a deceased soul is an act. A prayer of praise to God for good health, for having food in the, in the fridge, which most people don't even have, that's an act. And saying um, something, let's say, that helps another person, or giving, or donating, these are all acts. So it could be of the soul or of the body. And uh, yeah, so it's, I know it's, it's very difficult for people, especially if they don't have a family, they're in a nursing home and they're alone. It's like, how can I do an act? There's nobody around me to help. So you can do spiritual acts, you know, and that's you know, a way to compensate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Father, we have one more question. Someone just snuck in here. Her name's Marie. Go ahead, Marie. Hi, Father. In volume 35, March 22nd, 1938, is, it, is Jesus a surprise that when people are halfway between life and death, he appears in his last plea for their soul, I guess you would say? In your opinion, do you think that at the end, very end after the Antichrist and the, the mark of the beast and everything, that the Lord will still do that for everyone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's read that passage where you're referring to. Do you want to remind us of the date again? March 22nd, 1938, volume 35. Okay. Yes, this is volume 35. Jesus says, in that moment of disillusionment, in seeing and in experiencing firsthand how we, the Trinity, love the soul and do love it, 
the soul feels so much sorrow that it repents for not having loved us. So what does this suggest? That at the moment of death, God gives every soul infused knowledge of how much he loves them and how everything that he permitted, good and evil, in their life was for their own good. They have this knowledge at the moment of death. In this moment, the soul recognizes our will as the beginning and completion of its life. And to offer satisfaction, it accepts its death to accomplish one act in our will. Indeed, it behooves you to know that if the soul did not accomplish at least one act in our divine will, the gates of heaven would not be open to it. It would not be recognized as heir of the heavenly homeland, and the angels and saints would not admit it to their company. Isn't that interesting? The saints and angels have to admit you to heaven. Most people don't even reflect upon this reality. It's pure. It's unblemished. And they will not allow anything unblemished to enter. And he adds, Without our will, there is neither sanctity nor salvation. With the exception of the most perverted and obstinate, how many are saved by virtue of this entirely loving stratagem of ours, even if this means they have to endure a long period in purgatory? This is why at the moment of death, it may be called our daily soul snatching. It is the finding of the human creature who was lost. My daughter, the moment of death is the time of disillusionment. In that moment, all things present themselves one after the other to the soul and say goodbye. The earth is over for you. Now begins eternity. The soul undergoes an experience similar to that of being closed within a room with someone telling it, behind this room there is another room where there is God, heaven, purgatory, hell, in a word, eternity. But the soul cannot see any of these realities. It hears such things being described by others. Thus their words come across in such a way that the soul is free not to believe them. That is, the soul may not place any great importance on believing with certainty what the others have described. And this is where the soul may be lost or saved. If it listens to these voices, well, it welcomes eternity. If it doesn't, it welcomes damnation. So I believe that this will happen even in the end. Yes, as you mentioned, these end time events, God will always give the soul this opportunity no matter what. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you all thank for joining you. in. Father. And uh, all right, it's late here. I have to get up early and drive to Turin tomorrow. It's about a three hour drive back and forth and have to come back and do mass. So may God's blessing come upon you and remain with you always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget to keep me in your prayers. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.